Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Um, we're letting people in right now, so a few minutes and we'll begin. זאת בילה אומרת שלום לעמית. מה היא שומעת אותנו? בטח שהיא שומעת. ותכף נשים אותנו על שקט. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have um, Daniel Trifonov and Tomer Gvirtsman with us today. Um, I will introduce them shortly, and um, we will begin the interview. So um, Daniel Trifonov, Grammy Award-winning Russian pianist, um, winner of Musical America's 2019 Artist of the Year Award, has made a spectacular ascent in the classical music world as solo artist, champion of the concerto repertoire, chamber and vocal collaborator and composer. Combining consummate technique with rare sensitivity and depth, his performances are perpetual source of awe. Pianist Martha Argerich said of Daniel, he has, he has very, everything and more, tenderness and also the demonic element. I've never heard anything like that. Trifonov recently added his first Grammy Award to his already considerable string of honors, winning Best Instrumental Solo Album of 2018 with Transcendental, a list collection that marked his third title as an exclusive Deutsch gramophone artist. As the Times of London noted, He is without question the most outstanding pianist of our age. Daniil is the winner of the 13th Arthur Rubinstein competition held in 2011, when he also won the Pnina Zaltzman Prize for the best performance of a Chopin work, prize for the best piano performance of a chamber music piece and the audience favorite award. We are also very proud that Daniil Trifonov is a Tel Chai Piano Masterclasses graduate. And about Tomer Gvirtzman, an outstanding representative of the young generation of Israeli pianists, Tomer attended the Tel Chai masterclasses for several summers as a student and once as a faculty member. Tomer graduated from the Buchmann Meta School of Music, Tel Aviv University, where he studied with Ari Vardi and received his master's degree as well as artist diploma from the Juilliard School, where he is where he was a recipient of the prestigious Kovner Fellowship and worked with Sergei Babayan. Tomer was a member of the Carnegie Hall Residence Ensemble Connect, winner of numerous competitions and awards, including Young Concert Artist International Auditions, Weidman International Piano Competition in Shreveport, I hope I'm saying that right, in USA, um, the Aviv Competition in Tel Aviv, the Midwest Piano Competition in Loa, Iowa. Um, he debuted in London in Steinway Hall. Tomer was invited to perform in Nikolai Petrov's Kremlin Festival in Russia. Concerts as a soloist with orchestras in Israel, including performances with the Israel Philharmonic under Zubin Mehta, Israel Symphony, Jim Jerusalem Symphony, the Israeli Chamber Orchestra, the Haifa Symphony, And in the US, he has played with the Juilliard Orchestra in Carnegie Hall, Symphony of Silicon Valley, the Aspen Concert Orchestra, among others. I would like to recommend you set your screen on speaker view for best experience. And during the lecture, you are more than welcome to write questions and thoughts on the shared chat as um, they will be answered at the end by um, Tomer and Daniel. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone, and uh, hi, Daniel. Hi. So wonderful to have you here. You know, when they, uh, 
when Tel Chai was transferred from its original physical form to this uh, online form because of COVID, it was unfortunate, but I don't, I don't think we, you know, it would have been much harder to get you uh, the, the, the other way. So it was actually quite lucky uh, in a way. So we're very happy to have you here and um, pick your brain and, you know, hopefully there, you know, there are a lot of students here who have much to uh, learn from you. So I hope I can extract what they need to um, enhance their own pianism. So we actually met in Tel Chai for the first time. It was my first time there and your first time and I guess only time there, right? And it was already 11 years ago. It was just the summer before you moved to America and started studying with Sergei, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, I was already in awe uh, of you then, of course, uh, but I, I didn't really know that actually meeting you would have such a big impact on my life because um, it's a lot thanks to you actually that I later also moved uh, to Sergei after he got a recommendation about me from you. Um, and that, of course, my, the relationship I have with him is one of the most important and uh, influential that I had on my life. So, you know, to those of you who know you, to those of who you listening who know you, Daniel, as, as only a, a musician, I, I want you to also know that, you know, you are an incredible, kind and very supportive person as well. So, which is, you know, also as important as being the wonderful pianist you are. So one of, one of the first um, memories that I have from you, just to kind of set us off, is um, when I went to Cleveland for the first time to play for Sergei, and you were there and you were just learning uh, or about to perform Glazunov Second Piano Concerto. I, uh, I believe you remember that and, yeah, that's... and you, you were going to play it for Sergei and you asked me to accompany you to do second piano for you, which was very terrifying because it's a very hard accompaniment and I've never even heard the piece before. And I had to just sight read it there, then and there. Yeah, but it, it was quite good. terrifying, but I have, I, I have this very specific memory of us sitting at the pianos. I, I was to your left and I don't remember exactly how the piece goes. But the, the opening has some sort of like starts from the bass and then kind of yeah, goes it's up. in a B major and it starts uh, with uh, with a strings uh, 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 this beautiful team and then piano enters. Yes, yes. So uh, the the beautiful thing was obviously probably butchered by me, but then but then the, the when you entered with the piano, it really the sound you produced of the piano was really something that stick, stick with me until today. It was really like, you know, kind of a, a spring flowers coming out of, of the wing of the piano. It was really something very special. So, Well, actually, just, actually you know, the, the music itself, uh, this is one of the most spring-like concerti uh, that I know of. It has such an incredibly positive energy and... Uh, um, it, it's so it's so poetic also um it's I'm, I'm actually a little bit surprised it's not played more often it's it's almost virtually un, unknown and uh, it's it's very well orchestrated it has very kind of colorful um orchestration uh it's it's uh, it might not be a particularly pianistically difficult it's uh, it, it has its uh, awkward moments it's it's maybe not the most pianistical piece but it's there is there are no uh, unremarkable uh, passages or anything like that. So yeah, it's a, it's incredibly, uh, it's it's a music full of uh, sunshine, which is also a bit surprising, taking into account when it was written. It was written in uh, in the middle of World War One, mm -hmm. and it it couldn't be uh, further away from from the actual realities of the time. Yeah, well, maybe he tried to kind of. Uh... Escape it, yeah. Uh, contrast or kind of escape yeah. from, from the reality. Yeah. But, well, I mean, to say that the, the, the music is full of spring, then when I was so inspired by your playing, I tried to read it myself and it didn't quite sound like that. But, um, but 
but anyway, the whole the whole story was really to kind of get us in. We, you know, today we're trying to kind of um, understand, you know, pianism and dissect pianism. And I think one of uh, the key aspects of of pianism, as you would, I sure, are, I'm sure that you would agree, is um, sound production. So, I. I mean, to start with a with a very hard question, is uh, well, how the hell do you do it? How, well, you know, you imagine that it's like a flower coming to, uh, you know, in the spring when flowers are opening, you know, and in the way the the hand itself kind of opens up in a similar in a similar manner, almost outward, and once these muscles, the muscles on the inner side of the palm are stretched, they produce different sound. I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that everything should be played with, uh, uh, with like flat fingers or, or something like that. Uh, but, but sometimes, especially in the beginning, if, if I want really to open up the sound, um, I kind of, it, it's not even about how the fingers are touching the keyboard. It's more about how the wrist, be, uh, how the palm and wrist behave. And the thing which I try to always avoid is uh, to have a stagnancy in uh, in uh, motion anywhere. And um, for example, the wrist uh, wrist can can be used similar to I don't know um, like a painter brush. Uh, so it's uh, the painter uh, the painter brush uh, the painter wouldn't wouldn't. Uh, um, Mm, do a very uh, like ge geometrical strokes. It would be all very fluent, and um, um, in this way, I think we also can take even inspiration from from animals uh, who have a very organic way of physical behavior. Like the mm, like a tiger would not be able to uh, to sp mm, to spring with with grace if there was any any lock or tension in any of the joints. So, and of course it's difficult to achieve in a certain way because piano is not, uh, not the most uh, organic instrument when it comes to, I mean, I don't think any instrument is actually, uh, except voice maybe. Um, uh, I mean, we still have to come to the reality that we're sitting in maybe not the most natural position uh, and we have to elevate our pants uh, to have our hands suspended, so yeah, but, but we still should find a way to make it as as organic and fluent uh, as possible. Is is that something that you actively think of? Well, well both when you perform and also or when when you practice. How how does that come into play in your? Mainly when I practice. Uh, uh, I mean, usually. Uh, when I, when I don't like certain sound, I try to. I mean, I I, I try to just just think of what I, what I want, and um, most of the, most of the time I I'm not happy with something, so uh, I would try to kind of uh, try to try out different things. That was one of the, basically because of that uh, I came out um, I came up with um, this idea of uh, practicing in a swimming pool um, for like um, isn't it bad for the piano <laughs> yeah well um, <laughs> uh, if you put a piano inside there maybe um, no I'm joking of course. yeah yeah because uh, the thing is that um, well Rachmaninoff second concerto for example uh -huh. um, there um, I always was unhappy with how I was producing the sound because felt very sticky, uh, nothing said sticky, but very, you know, uh, it didn't have enough roundness and enough warmth. Specifically so, in that piece you felt? Yes, uh, in that piece because I guess I don't have a, the, the good body type for, for it, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure many people would disagree, but okay. <laughs> well, I, I had to, I had to mm, find, find my way around it and uh, um, so I started just, uh, I, I was in a, 
in Sarasota. Mm -hmm. It was Saratoga, Saratoga. That is where Philadelphia Orchestra has their summer festival. Mm -hmm. And I remember the hotel had a swimming pool, outdoor swimming pool. So I feel like after first rehearsal, I was so unhappy with my sound. And then I just went to the swimming pool and I thought, well, I need to do something with my shoulders. I need to open them up uh, because the sound I was producing was too much from the finger and it needed more of a body sound. So, and then I thought, why don't I actually start warming up for the concert in, in, the, in the swimming pool? And it was full of people. They all looked on me like I was some kind of a creep. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I was just, uh, you know, doing the motions with my hands, uh, kind of augmented practicing. Uh, you cannot uh, you cannot play as fast of course in the pool because there is a lot of resistance from the water yeah. and it's not really that much of a finger work it's more of a general motions of um, of, um, of shoulder blades and shoulders like the opening for example you know in a swimming pool just to play this uh, bell like chords mm -hmm. it's quite a bit of effort and you really need to go from kind of the middle of your spine to be able to do it and the, once i went out of the swimming pool i realized that my, my shoulders are much more opened up in my whole upper back. So, and then as a result, the sound was much better on concert. Mm. Is there a specific place in the, in the piece that you felt like there was some problems or you wanted to improve or? In or general, yeah. In general, especially more lyrical parts, uh, uh, ones that, that uh, needed very warm sound. I can think of the beginning, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, I can think of a second subject in E flat major, uh, also, where I, I felt like playing just using fingers was producing too thin sound, that it needed uh, a bit more rich, fulfilled uh, sound. So I was using more of my of my hand, kind of like even even with a with an elbow, kind of you know, on on each note, a uh, little bit little motion like that. Yeah, just using it's it's basically using gravity. You you, um, there, there is a lot of things which are kind of kinetic physics uh, in it. Right. Uh, so is that was it anything specific to the second concerto? I mean, did you feel more comfortable with with the third, for example, or the fourth? Or I mean, you played all. Well, of later, later I uh, fourth actually doesn't need that much of this practicing because fourth is very differently written. It doesn't have uh, as many places where you really need uh, to use full body. It's, first of all, it's uh, better orchestrated in a way. The, the second has quite prominent orchestra parts, so it's actually, mm, there are many places where a soloist can get uh, drowned. Uh, but in a fourth, not, not really. It's, it's uh, much more transparently orchestrated and, uh, and also the piano part itself is um, is differently written. The same can be applied also to uh, um, the Paganini Rhapsody. Uh, but the, yeah, third concerto, uh, swimming pool can help. And in general, any concerto where, where I need a uh, bigger, warmer sound, mm. like Prokofiev second, for example. Right. Yes. yes, yes. You can't have enough sound in that, in that piece. You can always give more, right? Mm. Um, so, one of the uh, first pieces I actually heard you play ever, and that was in Terchai, was uh, Musovsky Pictures and Exhibition, right? And I understand now that you are relearning it, or you've relearned it now to, to perform it in your current season? Well, actually, I'm, I'm not going to uh, perform it on concerts, but I decided to, well, now I, I had some time <laughs> to, right. uh, to, uh, to play different things. And actually, uh, when the, when the uh, pandemic started, I was actually quite nostalgic about all the, all the music uh, I uh, learned in the past. And I would be just sight reading, you know, uh, Chopin Mazurkas, uh, once I played and once I didn't play, um, uh, Chopin, uh, different other pieces of Chopin, uh, Mozart, sonatas. Uh, 
Yeah, and then eventually also Mussorgsky. So, and then I uh, got one, um, uh, one summer festival here, the uh, Sun Valley. Uh, they, um, uh, uh, they're doing now uh, digital uh, concerts yeah. uh, in, in their summer season. So uh, I agreed to participate and uh, yeah, I, I believe it's actually uh, it's going to be quite soon and uh, it's uh, this, this week. Uh -huh. and, and you're going to play that there? Uh, I mean, I actually or recorded it in New York in one of the uh, um, uh, studios. Um, it's going to be called, called uh, yeah, it's, it's in, in Midtown, there is a recording studio, so we recorded it there. There is also Beethoven, um, Sonata, number 18 is the one with the same opus with Tempest, which I actually also, the Tempest I played on, on Telhai as well. Right, yeah, I remember that, but wow. Yeah, yeah. so have you, have you played the, the Mussorgsky since, or was it the first time after 11 years that you, you came back to it? Uh, well, I played it actually in some concerts um, uh, after, after Telehai. Uh, the last time I played it, I think it was before Chopin competition uh, so in Italy in ago. September of 2010. So 10 years. Uh, yeah, since then I haven't played. But actually M Mussorgsky was, was also the piece that I, um, um, I played for the auditions in, in all the US. Uh, ah, for, so for Sergei? When you, uh... Well, uh, I mean, for all uh, on all the, uh, it, it was my oh, uh, for all audition, the... audition piece, yeah. Right. Oh, so so I, I just I wanted to ask you about what what is kind of the difference um, for you from when you learn a new piece for the first time and when you come back to a piece after after a long time. Did it feel now that you came back to it as if you had to relearn it from the beginning or was it already there and you kind of just had to dust it out? Well, I was actually more surprised with how many misprints are in some editions uh, <laughs> <laughs> with that piece. Uh, um, yeah, I had, to, I had to kind of actually search for the edition that, that didn't have too many. Um, and you, did you find one? Because I remember, yeah, yeah it's uh, uh, eventually you, you, you find one. It's, uh, uh, because the one I used was from, uh, it was a LAM uh, edition, it's from uh, kind of early Soviet uh, edition, I think. Uh, and that one is good, but there are some other ones which, has, which have um, such mistakes that uh, you wonder if um, editor even proofread anything. But yeah. Uh, but you know, actually, uh, when I was uh, when I was coming back to to that piece, um, uh, I just realized how different it is from any other piece of music in general. Uh, Mussorgsky was such an original also. mind, and uh, Mussorgsky also influenced. Shostakovich, for example, right. the language of Shostakovich uh, owes a lot to Mussorgsky, uh, I think. A very certain straightforwardness and uh, raw um, expression in Mussorgsky that's, uh, that was quite unique uh, for the time. I, I, can, I can think of maybe some works of Berlioz uh, for orchestra. Uh, from that uh, from that period that, that could have have uh, similar uh, similar energy, but yeah, it's quite unique. Mm. So th this piece is is very programmatic, right? I um, mean, there's kind of this clear story of somebody walking in the exhibition, and then every movement is a different picture. How how in, how much influence does that have? On your, on your interpretation, how much do you actually imagine those images, or or how much is it just kind of influenced by by the notes themselves that are that are written? 
I think the music often speaks for itself, actually. I don't necessarily have uh, like an image, like, a, like a, I don't imagine any of those paintings in my head. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you but, probably know the paintings that some I mean, of them that they're based on. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's uh, um, the, a lot of uh, a lot of mind work uh, is actually centered on just creating the atmosphere and knowing what you want to say and what what the, the music could be about. Uh, so it is um, a lot of it is just it's actual musical expression itself and, and creating atmosphere with. Uh, to me, music. Uh, can be as expressive as uh, as uh, visual arts. So, mm. well, of course, much more. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what did I want? So, do you do you treat also you know Chopin and Mozart and and, and pieces that are you know pure purely m musical? That's kind of the same way. You just you just go through the notes and, and get your inspiration from from the music itself, not trying to create some sort of, you know, extra musical idea that... I, in I mean, most of the case, yes. Uh, in most of the case, yes. It's actually, uh, I think the moment of getting to know the piece is very important. Mm -hmm. And I actually, in the very beginning, I, mm, I tried to not listen to recordings at first, but very few in the beginning. Right. Uh, then later, of course, I listen to a lot. Uh, but that's this very first moment of getting to know the piece is, I think, is quite important. And in that moment, I think it's it's important to actually let yourself uh, just feel it and um, uh, get captivated to see what what kind of emotions it stirs in you itself. Later, of course, you start to work on details and you you start analyzing the score, but but that first moment of reading the music, uh, and it, it, it doesn't have to be, I don't like to read just all one through because I want to actually get the atmosphere and energy of each place. So I might actually, when I read first time, I can uh, repeat several, uh, several parts, uh, several times to augment the, the atmosphere, which I think that place could create. Mm, I don't know, for example, Rachmanina's first sonata, when, when I started learning it, unbelievable music, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but even the first, uh, first uh, fix, it's D-A-D, and then the two, two chords in, in response, the dominant and tonic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would, I would repeat several times the first, uh, the first element, Kind of getting into different, different emotional words, worlds, and then the next response, um, how it how it would respond to that first uh, to that first theme. So, and then it would get certain atmosphere, certain atmosphere, and then I would go from there. That's that's fascinating. Um, so another another piece that you are. Um, that you played and recorded just now that you told me that when we started talking just before you said that you were listening to your own recording of it is uh, Bach, um, Art of Fugue. Uh, Art of Fugue. Mm -hmm. Yes. So just, I, I wanted to, you know, just in general, what, what made you want to learn, to learn this, this piece? Because it's not as played as, you know, I mean, Goldberg variations or, um, yeah, well, I, w I was uh, always uh, fascinated with music of Bach, and uh, I haven't, I, I mean, I, I did play it, I would say, quite regularly, uh, but I never really learned any, uh, any of, uh, mm, of the cycles. Uh, so, yes, and Art of a Fugue uh, is such an incredible work. It's, uh, in a way, to me, uh, Art of a Fugue is as important to, to music not just to music, to the, the whole history of humanity, it's uh, on par with, I don't know, uh, Einstein theory of relativity or Men uh, Mendeleev's um, uh, table of elements. Um, 
it's kind of explains uh, logic uh, in in the world. If, if you look, if you look at the, all the structure in in art of the field, um, it's uh, it has a, um, uh, how to say uh, incredible proportions, um, and yeah, it's it's as much of a mathematical masterpiece as it is a musical one, and it's especially impressive is how while maintaining all those strict rules he is still able to bring out a real human uh, emotion and uh, so it's not just uh, you know um, uh, a, a study to prove a calculation it's not, it's not just a calculation to prove yeah. a, a point that something is uh, is possible but it's actually serves a greater purpose yeah. Uh, it took it took forever to learn. Uh, I, I about a year and um, uh, last January before before I started playing it in February. I remember like for, for several weeks I had to practice seven to eight hours a day. Uh, go through you know you kind of fugues are quite difficult to practice because you need to uh, practice not only voice separately but also voice voices um, in pairs, soprano, alto, soprano. Uh, tenor, soprano, bass, and yeah. alto, uh, tenor, tenor, like bass, all, all, all the combinations. Yeah. And you know, the fugues are long, so uh, it takes quite a bit of time. But with music of Bach, you don't get tired. So sometimes, if, if I practice uh, some music, I, I eventually need to take a break. But with, with Bach, it's easier. Yeah. Um, well, I guess it's not, you know, like Prokofiev second that uh, you have to give so much uh, energy, but also it's, it's I don't know. I, I, I agree with you about that. Can you, can you give a specific example of some, you know, realization of, of something that you had there in the piece that some incredible well, discovery that you had? Uh, well, actually, one of the discoveries is that uh, Bach teams appears much earlier than last fugue. Uh, it's common to think that Bach teams is only in the last fugue, uh, but it's actually already in the counterpoint eleven as a reverse. When you say the, Bach team, you mean that when he puts his the, name? Yeah, his name, his name yeah. team is actually appears in a more hidden way as a reverse, uh, as a mirror of um, second subject of the. Uh, eighth fugue uh -huh. that is in the 11th fugue. In 11, it becomes uh, B A C H. Um, so, what do you think that means? The what? Mean ah, um, yeah, well, there, there are many different interpretations, and uh, there's so much to uncover. So, we, I'm, but I highly doubt it was random. No, of but, course but it's definitely not. Definitely was not random. And in fact, random. in fact, you know, in the um, uh, in the in there are two uh, editions of of this. One was published after uh, Bach's death, but uh, another one was published when he was still alive, and uh, uh, it doesn't have some of it doesn't have two of the canons, and it doesn't have the last fugue and uh, uh, fourth fugue. And they're arranged in slightly different order as well. And some fugues have different endings. Uh, there are quite quite significant dif differences. So we can see that actually Bach kept working and changing the cycle uh, throughout the years. It was not. Uh, it, it it took him a long time. So actually, that's actually your your we, that's a good segue to uh, an interesting topic that I would like to ask you about. What you just said that he continued working on it over and over. Um, which implies that potentially, you know, I mean, and that's something I'm not, I didn't come up with myself. That's something I heard from Sergei many times that, you know, if, if Beethoven would have, you know, lived for two more years or something, maybe he would have changed some, some markings in, in, you know, he change, would change a fortissimo to a forte or something like that in one of the sonatas to correct it. And nowadays when we, when we, in, go to a, a piece of music I mean especially Beethoven for some reason I have that we kind of tend to, to, to um, treat it as if it's some kind of a uh, you know something that you you cannot touch and you cannot do and you have to 
kind of follow 100% uh, the rules or, you know, what, whatever is written. And I mean, I'm not against it at all, but just kind of wanting to hear what is your take, take on that? Well, you know, we can always uh, remember uh, Rachmaninoff's uh, two recordings of his second piano concerto, one, is, one with Stokowski, another with Ormandy. Uh, they are several years apart, both with Philadelphia Orchestra, and in fact, quite different. And in fact, especially the first one uh, with Stokowski, uh, he actually does a lot of things that completely contradict uh, the score mm, to the point of actually changing uh, tempo, where he, where he writes uh, um, to play slower, he actually plays faster uh, in the same place, on, and where he would mm, uh, right to play louder he would actually play softer so he goes uh, quite opposite and I'm, I'm not even talking about uh, let's say scrabbing uh, uh, recordings yes. uh, I mean uh, scrabbing even changes the notes that, that, that he wrote the rhythm sometimes he changes um, like in uh, the poem of 32 number number one he actually uh, Makes a dotted rhythm, which uh, in, in in the in this run, ta -ta 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 he he actually ta -ta 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 he changes the rhythmical structure of the piece. So, but you gave examples from Scriabin and Rachmaninoff, which people tend to anyway play a little more freely. But do you think this also applies to you know interpreting Bach and Beethoven and Mozart, those kinds of things? Well, in a different way, of course. For example, with Bach, I would still be careful to use pedal, for example, if, uh, ah. uh, especially in the fugues, just, you know, because it, it might model the material. That's not to say that uh, um, no pedal um, should be used. In fact, uh, Bach did have uh, a, a piano, like early piano with pedal in the end of, in his life, I played on a copy of it. Uh, it's a very quiet instrument, but it has fully functional pedal. Uh, and yeah, while he didn't like um, early models of pianoforte, there have been progress for 30 years. He, he lived for another 30 years since the invention of first pianoforte. And there was a lot of progress in the uh, manufacturing of, of those. So, and that one with pedal sounds very, very different from first piano forte. So uh, we don't know whether he um, actually changed his opinion on uh, towards the end of his life, but right. we know that, that he actually owned one. Mm. So uh, now that you mentioned Bach and pedal, that's actually, you know, I mean, I also, you know, studied with Sergei and I know he's very adamant against, well, not, you know, there's not, there's no always or never, but, but in general, being very, very scarce, uh, or to the point of not at all, uh, to put pedal in Bach. So now that you played this uh, Art of Fugue, how did you treat it? Well, there are some places where it's unavoidable due to simple uh, physical limitations. It's, it's impossible to hold certain notes without pedal. Mm. Uh, Do you use the middle pedal? as well no 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 uh, the, uh, the right pedal yeah. yeah um um well in fugues it's it's more it's more tricky because the modern pianos already have quite dense uh sound soundscape and you don't want to model it more with uh, it's it's already you have to be aware to bring enough clarity in in a contrapuntal material but in in something that's more like a uh, like a fa fantasy uh, um, like in a fantasia uh, kind of uh, right. musical environment, you can apply uh, some pedal definitely. Um, the, the one thing that's probably I would say is um, important to keep in in Bach from that's maybe just personal. Uh, is um, um, not not go into the next bar uh, with uh, league, you know, not not link uh, too much. 
if if you play everything as one continuous alligator, it's uh, it still sounds nice, but I it's you know in a way uh, if you hear a, a lot of uh, historical instruments how we play, I'm not saying that we should imitate historical instruments. It's uh, no, we are not playing on them anyway, but um, but certain aspects are important, such as for example uh, a lot of um, phrases cannot have too many notes under one lick. It's it's very often just few, especially in a in a slower in a slower fugues. Interesting. And you mentioned the bar line should be the. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, I'm not saying like uh, stomp right. the foot on on each uh, on each right. bar, but, of course, of but course. not to, but not to uh, go into the uh, not go through bar line uh, with uh, with lick. Uh, well, there are some exceptions, of course, but normally, I think it sounds uh, the rhythmical rhythmical structure is preserved more. Uh, and another thing is actually sometimes we might feel that we want to do a uh, uh, crescendo in Bach because the musical material gets more uh, more intense and we intuitively want to somehow help it with, uh, with uh, volume augmentation. But it's actually very often does not necessarily work in a good way. Sometimes it's, it's good to delay that, uh, that crescendo until much later. Um, because the music itself has already enough intensity to build up the, the climax and sometimes um, keeping it in the in these earlier stages of development is better. Mm. That's very interesting. Um, so I, I have a, a, a kind of a general question uh, to you kind of stepping away from Bach. Um, that I'm, I'm very interested in knowing how you approach that. So as, um, you know, pianists, artists, we actually, I was just listening to uh, the workshop that was just before us talking uh, with Guy, who is a jazz pianist, who gave a, um, uh, a workshop about improvisation. And he said something very interesting there that I thought about, but he kind of articulated in a very nice way, is that, you know, actually playing, um, even playing written pieces is a form of improvisation because, because the way that you, you play it is, you know, you're making it up on the spot, even if you're playing the, the notes that are written. And something that is particularly striking in, in your playing and I think something that sets you apart from many other uh, pianists in the world is that when when you play it it really feels like you are you know making up even if it's a piece that everybody heard a million times and you played a million times it sounds like it's really just you're making it up with us and we're kind of witnessing to the creation of something which is completely new. So having this kind of impression from hearing you from the outside, it's interesting for me to kind of try to understand with you, how, how, do, how do you approach it in terms of balancing between kind of uh, preparing and planning everything and just, I don't know, letting it go and and letting the music flow well actually i was uh, thinking about it a lot in, in in the past and i tried actually different things i tried to understand when it's best to predict music when it's best to think about music as a as a simply reaction on the music or before and if before uh how much time before uh, so and or what? sorry uh, to, well to um, when mu music should appear in your mind before it appears in, uh, in mm. your fingers. so right. so before the actual how much in advance how much in advance and okay. uh, actually uh, I tried some some practicing with most of concerts it's it's more difficult to do it with um, I mean it's actually kind of impossible to do it with music that has a lot of rubato 
but with Monster Concerti, for example, I would put a recording and then I would play as a canon two bars or one bar later. Uh -huh. So I would hear the recording, I would hear the music uh, with my ears, but my fingers would be doing it one bar later. And that actually helped a lot for the, for the shape of the phrase. Um, Interesting, but doesn't the harmony, uh, you know, collide and create some sort of a cacophonous foam? Um, yeah, but you filter it out. Uh, okay. I mean, the, the point is that you concentrate your ears. You, you concentrate your ears on what you are here in the recording, and yeah, and then your fingers just just follow. It's it's a little bit tricky. It's it's. Uh, uh, I mean, it's easy to make a mistake, in, uh, especially right. in the beginning. Uh, but it's an uh, interesting mind exercise, I find. So uh, the thing uh, with, with practicing also, I, I, I often, as, as I said earlier, I often see the reaction, what kind of reaction, emotional reaction it, it creates. And then I kind of try to do this pre-reaction. This what? Pre-reaction. Pre uh -huh. Okay. What, so what? On, uh, on, on a concert is you cannot just simply react to everything that's, uh, that will make everything very, uh, maybe too uh, sloppy. Um, I'm very risk of that. Um, but um, yeah, if you have a uh, pre reaction, you know how you hear the music before and you react on it, and then you have time to actually do something about it when you play. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I would call it like a pre reaction. I mean, a reaction on on interpretation in your mind. Mm. That's that's so. So, before we talked, you you wanted you said you wanted to to share uh, a recording that you uh, that you enjoy. So, can you can you say a few words about it? Maybe we can we can listen to it. Well, uh, yeah, I've uh, I thought that uh, we talked about Sergey and. Uh, mm, um, you, you know, the, I actually the, in uh, uh, mm, I also studied with uh, Tatiana Zelikman, right? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, they're both um, as students of students of Henrik Neuhaus, and uh, there is a lot of uh, shared ideals uh, about music, I believe. Uh, and so, uh, I just wanted to show one of. Uh, one of very interesting recordings of Neuhaus. I really love how Neuhaus plays Scrabbing in general. Um, uh, there is certain poetic freedom to, to the way he, he approaches it. And uh, the recording might not be in, in great quality engineering wise. It's, uh, it's actually, I think, like a half tone higher than it, <laughs> than it should be. Uh, but it's, uh, yes, it's a great recording of Scrabbing um, Opus 32, number one poem. Uh, uh, it's one of the pieces which I recently was was playing. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite recordings. Okay, so can, can we hear it? Uh, yes. <laughs>
What was this last piece? I, I uh, it's it's not usually doesn't go together. With yeah, that's from Opus Fifty Nine. There, um, there are actually quite um, quite interesting works in fifties opuses. There is, um, I think, op also Opus Fifty Seven, if I'm not mistaken. Um, um, yeah, there are, uh, sonatas have. Um, even number usually, and the, those uh, pieces have odd numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it's opus 61, also opus 63. Um, yeah. So, yeah, this this recording is is abs absolutely beautiful. I um I particularly liked how he he's so free with the time, but there's there's never anything that feels flowery or like he's trying to you know show off some 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 you know smell smell the roses as as they uh, as they say i mean it's uh, it's very flowing all the time but then when you realize he's taking so much time in in some places but you don't even you don't even realize that do you do you agree or yes yeah, it's, it's very organic actually i remember the um the analogy actually Sergei uh, used in one of the, one of the lessons is that uh, about smelling flowers is you know there there was this Soviet cartoon uh, about a train that was always late because he always every time he would be in a nice place he would stop by and smell flowers like uh, uh, in a field or something as a result the train was always late and yeah <laughs> it's, it's, very cute uh, cartoon, but um, so the train has. The to point is that there, there, is, there is still certain respect to the time. That you shouldn't completely abandon all the notion of uh, of of motion, um, but yes, you also shouldn't be just uh, you know not not reacting to certain things. It's just a, that that reaction time can be taken, but it cannot go to complete. Uh, Abandonment of uh, of direction and this music the, the way the way Nachhaus plays it even with all the time it always has a direction and um, you can you can take as much time as long as there is direction. So interesting. So now I want to ha give the opportunity to some of the people who are listening to ask you some questions. So I see already some people wrote three questions. So please I urge you. Uh, those of you who li are listening, this is a really incredible opportunity to pick the brain of one of the, our, you know, the greatest pianists of our time. So please don't be shy and write some more questions. But in the meantime, why don't I ask you uh, what whatever we have now? So from uh, Lao Mo, um, they ask. Um, what do you do when you play or even listen to a piece which has an extra musical history for the first time? 
Do you like to get deeper into the history or just feel it yourself as if it was not programmatic? Uh, I mean, so certain context, if, if music has certain context, of course it helps. Actually, even when I, uh, the piece doesn't necessarily have a context, for example, Rachmaninoff Sonata number one, in the, in the beginning he wanted it to be, uh, it to be Faust Sonata. First movement Faust, second uh, Grafian, third uh, Mephistopheles. But then in the end he abandoned that idea, perhaps he didn't want to put too much emphasis on the programmatic element of, of the music. Uh, however, the, uh, those images are still there, those uh, uh, character models, I would say. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Since you play so many recitals of all over the world, um, Evan is curious how you come up with your programs. Do you structure them based on a main theme or maybe use pieces that are connected to each other in some way? Well, there are uh, certain main pieces which I want to learn and then I ask Sergei for, uh, for an opinion what, uh, what, is, what would be great to pair it with. And uh, um, as a result, my programs become bigger and bigger. And uh, yeah, sometimes it might be difficult to, uh, to, to play often these kind of programs. So like, for example, I almost never play a uh, day in a row my recital programs because uh, I need time to rest in, in between, usually only our second day. Yeah, your recitals are, are huge. I remember one recital you had for the second half only all the list etudes, all the list transcendental etudes. I mean, that's that's you know enough work it's for. Not, a... It's not good to uh, to spread them. It's not no, good to no, break no, them no. up into two halves. It's, it it has to be in one half. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But but still, I mean, it's it's just a, a gargantuan feat. Um, okay, so we have. Another question from Lao Mo. Please write more questions if, you know, this is a great opportunity. Um, I would love to hear your personal experience. Do you, how do you manage concentration when playing a long solo recital? This is a very, I, I would be happy to hear your answer to that as well. Not over um, stimulating yourself on the day of a concert uh, to, uh, I try not to meet too many people on the day of a concert. I try to kind of keep it to myself and don't really uh, waste the energy and concentration before concert. It's kind of like a low power mode uh, before, the, before the performance. Mm -hmm. If I do too many things, if I don't know, I go hiking or something, uh, or if I uh, uh, a short spot too long um, that that might interfere. It's good to rehearse a lot the day before, but right. on the concert I try to keep it in a very. I, I try to preserve energy. Uh, do you feel generally that you are able to keep the, the same level of focus for most of your concerts, or sometimes you feel like you know? you're having a, an off day and, and how, yeah, how do you kind of work it's, that? it's actually more difficult to, uh, to have maximum uh, um, concentration after long travel, for example. Um, especially a few days after, you know, jet lag. Uh, jet lag is probably um, something that affects it most, but not in the beginning. I Several times I played recitals right after um, after intercontinental flight. Wow. And it's actually uh, was easier to play. It was, um, it would be more difficult a few days after. Mm, so, so? so I would, I would arrive uh, to the place. I would go to take a nap for a couple of hours and then I would, uh, I would play in the evening. Uh, and that would be still uh, fine. But then a few days, like next day and maybe day after, that would be already much more difficult. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, let's, so a question from Jack. Um, so many pieces in your repertoire, with so many pieces in your repertoire, how do you organize your time to practice everything effectively? 
That's a good yeah, question. In advance, I often, when I'm on tour with one thing, I practice what I have to play next. Ah, interesting. Okay. Um, okay, let's see. From Andre, uh, he has a question about your transcription of vocalese by Rachmaninoff. <laughs> Uh, which is very beautiful. You used the B flat minor, which sounds nice and fresh, but originally the original key is C sharp minor and E minor. Could you please share your thoughts about creating the, this transcription using the key of B flat minor? Uh, well, I was not uh, so particularly happy with how the piano alone sounds, uh, uh, sounds with that piece uh, in uh, more sharp keys. I mean, the, the, uh, the voice is quite mellow usually for uh, for this music um, and it softens with sharpness but when played on piano alone it's maybe a little bit too thin um, both keys so I wanted to go to a, a flat uh, to a flat key and uh, I, I, I actually I tried basically every single key and then I, I liked most how it sounded in B flat minor and actually there is another transcription which is a bit more closer to the original in terms of uh, uh, how the chords are arranged, because I, I arrange them in a, in simply in a in a wider uh, wider position. Uh, but the, um, Zilotti Zilotti did uh, a very good um, piano transcription. Uh, he was, uh, I believe, uncle of uh, Rachmaninoff uh, and uh, oh, uh, cousin um, and. Um, it's also in B flat minor. Ah. So did you know that transcription before no. you did those? Then okay. I discovered it later and I was like, well, okay, it's good that I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So a question from Hilda. Um, what has enabled or encouraged you to develop and maintain the stamina necessary for an active touring schedule? Do you travel with companions? How do you manage the adrenaline rise and fall? that accompanies long concerts? Well, actually, uh, the adrenaline uh, fall is something that you have to wait for because, uh, yeah, that's, that's probably more complicated part of touring is how quickly you get back from elevated emotional state during a concert to a more calm state. It's sometimes, especially if it's like first time I'm playing a certain piece or, um, uh, um, it's sometimes difficult to fall asleep for several hours after after concert ends. So, uh, and paired with uh, with different time zones, uh, yeah, that, that can create certain uh, certain difficulties. Yeah. Okay. So a question from Kezia: uh, How long do you take to learn? Uh, to learn a concert level piece before you perform them in public? <laughs> Depends on the piece. Rachmaninoff um, Concerto number three, I remember I learned like in a month, maybe a month and one week. Wow. Um, but then it took long time for me to kind of uh, understand what exactly I want in the interpretation. Right. So uh, as, as I was playing, it was, of course, changing. Uh, some pieces, like Arthur Hugh, could take a very long time. Uh, as you said, it took me basically a year. I mean, of course, not continuously a year. I would, I would start it, and then I would come back. So I mean, all in all, it was maybe three months. Uh, but still, it's, it's a lot of time. Um, uh, some pieces can be uh, learned, of course, much quicker. Hmm. Let, let me interject with a question of my own. Um, would you, well, I, since you're a composer, I also assume that you, you improvise because mm -hmm. otherwise you wouldn't be able to come up with your pieces. Um, would you, or did you ever improvise on stage? Uh, if I mess up, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean. Not, uh, not to cover for, uh, but, but an actual improvisation. Like I haven't a, tried it. I haven't tried it. Would you? Um, 
I thought it would be probably interesting and uh, yeah, that has to be a special setting. I, uh, I don't know how comfortable I would feel doing it. Uh, Maybe not first time in Carnegie Hall, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I I never tried it. Maybe maybe one day it could be a fun thing to try. Okay. So another question from Inon. Uh, when you face a completely new piece, how do you begin working on it? For example, what is your practice plan uh, with this piece for the first week or two? Well, I uh, start with uh, getting the novice piece. And uh, I, I, as, uh, as we spoke earlier, I don't really... I listen to many recordings in the very beginning, but then it's very good to hear as many different recordings as, as you can uh, to see the different viewpoints on it. And um, uh, yes, just uh, just understands how the piece itself, uh, all the details in the piece, how they make uh, uh, they make you feel. I mean, it might sound a little bit naive, but um, what kind of um, uh, reaction it's uh, it starts in you right. so okay so another question from milena um about composition uh we all know that you are a composer as well what are your influences do you compose at the piano first how do you combine composing with extremely busy concert schedule uh, it's very unorganized uh, i have no idea when when I'm writing, when I'm uh, when I'm not writing, sometimes I don't write for several years, and then suddenly I have a ton of material, or like in a very short time, uh, and and I start working on it. So, mm. and in it's completely unrelated to like if I have free time, if I don't have free time. Sometimes it uh, ideas can come up on a <coughs> on a busy tour, and that's uh, always quite quite a challenge to you know. Yeah. Are you composing anything right now? Uh, not in the moment, but uh, actually one of the last things I did was, I, I don't know how much it is actual composition, but yeah, it is composition. Um, I made a, uh, you know, in, in Art of a Fugue, in, in Canons, I mean, in, in general, in Art of a Fugue, uh, he never used team backwards, uh -huh. which I mean, you you as you would assume that uh, the, if he lived longer, he probably would add more and more because the possibilities of contrapuntal development in that of the fugue are not fully explo uh, fully exploited yet. Uh -huh. So, yeah, he never did a backward team. So I made a canon that uses uh, a backward team. In, in reverse, so it's a reverse team in backward motion. Did you add it to the recording? Not yet. No, that's, that's just something I did more for, for myself. But oh, is it, it was an interesting process to see that, I mean, technically, uh, uh, yeah, if, if, if Bach lived longer, I'm sure he would write possibly more fugues and more canons. Yeah. Okay, so last question. Well, maybe there are a couple more. Okay, how do nerves play a factor in your recitals? Do you use any breathing exercises of, or have any pre-recital rituals? Well, I, I mean, it's uh, breathing as in the sense to get more oxygen in, get more oxygen quickly in the head. Yes, uh, that's never a bad thing, but. Not, not something, uh, not something specific. Uh, I sometimes I do qigong, uh, but not necessarily before concert. It's, uh, yeah, I do it relatively regularly, maybe twice a week, uh, but not every day. Sorry, what is that that you do? Qigong, uh, qigong it's a Chinese, uh, uh, well, most martial arts in China, they, uh, they originate from Qigong. Okay. So, I, yes. I, I didn't know. Okay, so um, maybe one last question. Um, so I was very interested to hear your practice method of playing a measure or two behind the recording. 
do you have any other practice techniques that you would like to share with us? Well, uh, another uh, practice technique is actually uh, something uh, Sergei uh, told me to um, to try, and uh, I found it to be uh, to be helpful. And I use it quite regularly is to play the same phrase with very contrasting emotional states, uh, especially in Japan, kind of to increase the emotional capacity for a certain phrase to not lock yourself in, in into one way of reacting to the music, of one way of reacting to the music. So it's um, take one one phrase. I, I'm talking about like the whole the whole melody, like se several uh, several bars or like the whole line or even more than one. Uh, and uh, try to perform it uh, while practicing as you know as if an actor who tries different expression for a certain role and uh, sometimes and sometimes trying out even ways that seems counterintuitive to the music uh, the same the same material to try to play with a very uh, let's say uh, hopeful um, uh, element or more um, like uh, faithful or uh, with I don't know with a lot of tenderness or which whichever dozens sometimes of uh, of different emotions and this emotional increasing that emotional range I think it's actually quite uh, quite helpful uh, both in earlier stages of learning the piece and also later to make it not to because sometimes our bad habits can uh, can get ingrained uh, in us and uh, it's very easy to come back with them and that kind of opens up and freshens the ears well daniel um i want to thank you for your time from all of us I mean, I learned a lot from talking to you, and it's always a pleasure. Um, so, you know, I hope we get to see you here in Israel perform uh, sometime soon. Hopefully. And until then, please send my love to uh, Sergey and to Judy. And, um, you know, all the best to you in everything you do. Thanks. Uh, so thank you. And thank yeah. you, all of, all of you who uh, listened. I hope you learned. Thank you, Tomer. Thank you, Tomer Gwirtzman and uh, Daniel Trifonov. It was such an honor, great honor to have both of you. Um, and I believe that um, our audience was very intrigued. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, tomorrow we have um, two lectures. Um, with uh, Eli Hefetz on Alexander Technique and with Ido Ariel on um, the uh, relationship status between pianists and uh, singers when accompanying singers. So um, we invite you to join us uh, tomorrow and thank you once again, Tomer and Daniel. It was a great honor. Thank you. Bye. Bye.